I Follow Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Book 4, Chapter 21, Blind Men and Sight Givers Not without instruction do we notice that the woman who had come secretly and hoped to depart unobserved was asked by Jesus to reveal her experience before all the people, while he who came publicly was led away from the multitudes to the seclusion of his house and exhorted to silence. The common need of all who sought the healing power of Jesus was their infirmity. There the likeness stopped. Their character, their background, their deeper spiritual wants were all diverse. When they came in faith, the Lord gave physical healing to them all. At that point, his ministration to their spiritual needs began, differing with each according to his character. The nobleman has to spend a restless night far from home. The paralytic must receive the consciousness that his sins are forgiven. The disciples have to watch their boat filling with water. The man who was called Legion must remain on the farther shore. The woman has to confess her secret. Jairus must reveal nothing to the questioning crowds that are even now waiting at his gate. Nor is it greatly different with us. The general ministration of Jesus ends when we rise from the waters of his mystic grave, general only because it is the experience of grace to all those who come to him in faith. It is a supreme and solitary occasion to the individual, a crisis in which he feels the cumulative power of all Christ's miracles. The leprosy of sin, the blindness of ignorance, the paralysis of fear have all been washed away. He starts a new life which begins with that touch of power. But there the peculiar need commences. By living upon every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, by exercising the wondrous privileges of prayer, communion and fellowship, we shall continue to receive the ministrations of Jesus, revealing and correcting our weaknesses, supplying our own particular needs and preparing us for the glory of his return. The silence which Jesus imposed upon Jairus would seem to have been for his own spiritual benefit. Certainly the secret could not be long withheld. Where the hand of Jesus rests, there is no occasion for convalescence. And the maiden was immediately ready to enter again into the joyful companionship of her friends. Thus it is no surprise to learn from Matthew that the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. It was impossible for Jesus to stay in Capernaum. So he left the lake, crossing the richly cultivated and beautiful plain of Gennesaret, climbing upwards into the hills where the corn and the fruit gave place to the steeply sloping vineyards, and then, turning towards the southwest, he approached the familiar landscape surrounding Nazareth. During this journey towards his former home, Two blind men followed Jesus, crying after him, Thou son of David, have mercy upon us. They recognized him as the promised Messiah and knew he could cure them. As his ministry went on and all men saw his power, we find Jesus making increasingly heavy demands upon their faith. So it was here. Jesus did not pause to heal them. He walked on, apparently unheeding. It was probably a long time before he reached a house for rest and refreshment. By dint of great effort and much pleading with their fellows, the blind men were still behind him, and finally they groped their way into the house and found him. Believe ye that I am able to do this? Fervently they made answer, Yea, Lord. 
once more faith became the link between the poverty of man and the abounding goodness of God. Jesus touched their sightless eyes. They opened to look upon the most precious vision human or spiritual eyes can behold. They looked up into the face of Jesus. Jesus had sad memories of the last visit he had paid to the town of his childhood and youth. With murder in their hearts, his townsmen had taken him up the, the surrounding heights, intending to fling him to his death. Although during the intervening months his fame had spread to every quarter, he found things little better on this occasion. Where there is no response to the love of God, there can be no hope of change in a man, a town, or a nation. On this occasion the people of Nazareth made no attempt on his life, but they were unable to surmount the obstacle of that little house on the hillside with its adjoining workshop. Nor could they forget his mother and his brethren. When he would heal their sick, the responsive faith was missing, and he could do few works of power. At last he left them, never to return. He went to the surrounding towns and villages where greater faith brought richer rewards. During his ministry in the neighbourhood of Nazareth, Jesus sent out to the twelve on their first great commission as apostles. One object in doing this was undoubtedly to spread both the gospel and the power of the gospel far and wide. An even more imperative reason was to prepare them for their ultimate high vocation. They had learned by a hundred tokens the authority which lay behind the words of their Lord. They had sheltered behind him when critics had taxed them with their conduct. They had grown dependent upon him in times of physical danger. But already he saw the first signs of a storm which would not abate until it took him from them. With that love which marked all his dealings, he bestowed power on them and sent them forth. They would go conscious that he was not far from them, whilst the power they had received would give them growing confidence in the true work for which they had been chosen. It is no surprise that before he sent them forth on their great adventure, Jesus gave them both instruction and counsel. His words to them are most fully recorded by Matthew. It seems that the whole vista of discipleship opened before him and he saw their work continuing long after their own labours were over. But the warnings and the promises which both met and passed beyond their own day were true in principle for all who follow, just as the instructions given specifically for them represent the spirit of true ministry to every age. The direct instructions the twelve received were to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and preach the advent of the kingdom confirming their words by works of healing. They were not to make careful preparations for their journey, but upon entering a city they were to search out who in it was worthy, and there stay and receive the hospitality that was due to them. They were given power to bring peace into a household, and to utter judgment upon family or city. Jesus then seems to have lifted his eyes to watch these men going forth a few years later on the same great mission to be met by hatred, imprisonment and death. He will no longer be with them, save in spirit, so he speaks to them now, words of wisdom and love which they may treasure in their hearts and must never forget. He tells them that when they are witnessing for the truth in those future days, they must realise that they are not alone. There will be no need to prepare their own defence. It shall be given you in that hour, 
what he shall speak. He sees the time when allegiance to him will bring a sharper sword than a weapon of war, a sword that shall cleave through a family, dividing son from father and daughter from mother. He reminds them that they will be treading his road. It is the privilege and price of discipleship that the disciple shall be as the master. Following him they will be harmless as doves. They must also be as wise as serpents, not going forward stubbornly to meet unnecessary persecution, but fleeing from city to city, that the things they have learned in secret may be proclaimed from the housetop. Nor must they lose their perspective. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus gave them his assurance that in doing his work amid all this hostility and danger, they were in his Father's special care. The very hairs of their head were numbered. He put the incentive before them as something which would give meaning to their sacrifices and sweeten all their sufferings. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Finally, their Lord reaches the climax of his discourse in words treasured and feared by disciples down the ages. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So might he have beautifully summed up his Sermon on the Mount. But he brings it into the context of this remorseless conflict, which is inevitable for those who follow the man who moves steadily to the cross. The disciples did not then, of course, understand the fateful connection between the cross they must take and the master they must follow. They did understand in the fullness of time, and then they spoke not of their crosses, but his. For the moment they understood the cross to mean the deepest disgrace and ignominy, which it would be necessary for them to suffer for his sake. And they saw dimly what they would perceive with greater clearness soon, that following Christ they could only find life by letting it go. So Jesus sent forth his men with counsel and guidance which, taking them far beyond the needs of the present expedition, would help them to join the great company of those of whom the world was not worthy, but who, having obtained a good report through faith, will at last receive the promise.